Welcome everyone. Um, we're glad to have you all here virtually with us. Um, we're obviously adjusting just as many of you are out there. And uh, we had the first part of our annual meeting last week and took care of the business, the official business of the commission. And this week is the more interesting part. And um, very excited, we have a panel of experts who are going to discuss the impacts of COVID-19 on the local economy, how businesses, communities, and other organizations have creatively adapted in these difficult, complicated times. Um, I can't think of a more appropriate topic right now, uh, and it's certainly one that's appropriate for regional planning commissions to be focusing on. Um, so we're going to have, um, I'll just speak briefly about the layout and Shana will go into detail about it. So we're gonna have three 20 minute presentations and the questions and answers will come after that. Um, and Shana, take it away. Okay, Victoria gave you a little bit uh, of information on the topic. Um, I'm gonna go over just some Zoom logistics. So um, this is webinar style. So everyone coming in as an attendee, we cannot see or hear you. Um, we are asking that the chat function be used mostly for technical issues. Um, we have Rachel on. Um, her video is not on right now, but she's on here as a presenter mode, so she can try to answer any technical questions. Um, she's not a Zoom expert, so she's going to try her best. Um, we really appreciate her helping us. And there is a uh, Q&A function. We're going to be using that for question and answer. So if any point during any of the panelists presentations you have any questions, use that feature um, to type in your questions and we'll be able to see those and compile them to answer at the end. Um, so that's just some of the logistics. Um, and as Victoria said, we have three presentations. They're going to be about 10 to 20 minutes each um, and then we'll have question and answer at the end. So I will give a little intro to each of our presenters before they kick it off. Um, we have today with us Emmett Soldati, um, born and raised in New Hampshire's smallest city, which is Summersworth. Uh, he's an entre entrepreneur, filmmaker, and local provocateur. He attended Emerson College and graduated from York University summa cum laude with a degree in film and visual anthropology before receiving his master's in cultural studies from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, after an unexpected house fire and subsequent decision to get sober, Emmett left London and returned to his sleepy hometown in search of connection he couldn't find in the fast and anonymous metro met metropolis. After losing a city council race in Summersworth, New Hampshire at the age of 22, Emmett opened a cafe, Teetotaler, to create vibrancy in his one road downtown. His cafe blossomed into a hub of LGBTQ activity and community. He graced the cover of the Huffington Post for erecting a 25-foot billboard of a non-binary teenager and recently hosted almost every 2020 presidential candidate over bubble tea. We also have with us today Sean Menard. He joined Seacoast Eat Local in May of 2019 as the program director. Prior to working with Seacoast Eat Local, Sean worked at the Gardner Food Co-op in Gardner, Maine as the general manager. He also previously worked as the produce manager for the Concord Food Co-op in Concord, New Hampshire. His work at co-ops included coaching new farmers and producers, crop planning, and customer education. Sean received a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Maine, Farmington, and a Master's in Science in Management with a concentration in sustainability from New England College. <laughs> um, as program director for Seacoast Eat Local, Sean oversees the operational success of Seacoast Eat Local's core programs, hosting winter farmers markets, operating the Seacoast area mobile market, supporting SNAP benefits at farmers markets year round, and the publication of the Seacoast Harvest Local Food Guide. His role is also to coordinate fundraising, development, marketing efforts, um, and in his work with Seacoast Eat Local, he strives for a world of connected food communities where consumers have the knowledge and resources they need to eat more locally grown food than food from away. He is also passionate about developing the business skills and opportunities of all farmers and growers. Sean also serves on the network leadership team for the New Hampshire Food Alliance, where he collaborates with several, several other food systems experts to strengthen statewide efforts. And last but not least, we have Jen Marsh. She is the Economic Development Specialist for the City of Rochester. In her position, she is charged with all facets of economic development, including cultivating prospects, identifying available sites, business retention and expansion, and community engagement. Jen is currently the chair of the Technical Review Group, president of Rochester Main Street, and a member of the Milton Economic Development Commission, 
and holds a degree in business with a specialization in international finance from American University in Washington, DC. So just a welcome to all of our panelists and we are gonna turn it over to Emmett who is gonna kick off the presentation. Righty, thank you everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Shana, you can tell me if you can see. Um, I, it's all set, I think it looks good. All righty, if you see me, then it's right. Hello everyone, uh, Emmett Soldati here, reporting live from Summersworth, New Hampshire. Uh, I, as Shana mentioned, I have owned a cafe called Teetotaler um, for almost a decade now in downtown Summersworth. Uh, and it is a space for those that haven't been uh, that we really pride ourselves on being a colorful, vibrant gathering space. Uh, though we are a sort of traditional bakery, cafe and restaurant uh, in the food service industry, uh, it's been really important for us to have a place in downtown Summersworth where folks can gather and um, build community around. And so this was on March 13th, my most recent job. I was just pouring lattes, uh, serving customers, sometimes fixing broken restaurant equipment, um, but really just the regular uh, ordeal of any restaurant owner. Um, and all of that changed on March 14th when we unfortunately had, the, had to make the decision to close our doors. And, uh, you know, because we are a space that prides ourselves on gathering people inside and having community events, we have a stage, it was really difficult for us to imagine how we were going to navigate uh, the, the several different reopening plans um, throughout the coming weeks and months. Obviously on March 14th and 15th, we didn't know how long it would be. Um, but very quickly as we saw the different phase plans uh, locally and statewide, uh, it just didn't make sense that our business model was gonna match that. Not only do we pride ourselves on being a gathering space, we are 100% scratch kitchen and bakery. And the idea of passing along a latte art and avocado toast through a to-go container for curbside pickup just didn't really translate well. And uh, so I knew then that if we were going to uh, keep our business uh, kind of afloat and relevant, uh, we had to kind of adapt and transform. And so we made a couple decisions pretty early on. The first is we decided that we were not going to reopen our physical establishment in Summersworth until 2021. We made that decision in April when the best guess was that uh, maybe we could open in a couple months or maybe restaurants might open in the fall. And for us, we really felt that not only was there the public health concern, there was also the economic concern. Because we are a space that gathers so much, we do a lot of bookings and we do a lot of parties and bridal showers and baby showers. And all of those happen April through June and all of them are canceled. And so for my business model, I knew that we weren't going to make enough money if we were to just reopen at any point after our busiest season. And that could put my business and indeed my employees in an yet another precarious economic situation. At the same time, like every other Main Street business owner, just because we had to close our doors and the income stopped didn't mean our bills stopped. We still had payroll commitments from the previous two weeks when we closed. We still had to pay rent, our insurance, our utilities, uh, and several other different bills, license fees and expenses um, that we really had to figure out how we were gonna manage. This was long before we heard federal or statewide um, sort of supplies or support um, from grants and loans. So we came up with sort of three ideas or three strategies to adapt our business model, this, this from scratch community gathering space, the space that had exploded into supporting LGBTQ community and activism, uh, and to bring that to people where they were at. Um, so the first order of business is we knew we needed to get online. We had been blending our own teas and making beverages from scratch uh, for the entire decade, uh, but we didn't really have an online store where people could shop. And we saw that there was an immediate appetite uh, when the quarantine began that folks wanted to support us. Um, and even folks further afield from the Seacoast region or Southern Maine also wanted to support small businesses. And so we recognized there was an addressable market there. Um, and so we took all of our loose leaf tea products 
and we updated the packaging uh, under the brand Chai Curious. And we started a loose leaf tea subscription company uh, that has now allowed us to continue to reach customers locally and across the entire US. Um, and because it's a subscription model, we are able to uh, have some dependent recurring revenue that it's not just subject uh, to hopefully people go on our website this week or hopefully you know, people come in the store um, and shop with us. Uh, as part of that, we put out a video to kind of promote it. Let me go switch gears here. I might have to just reshare Shana to get the sound on. Here we go. A uh, little multimedia presentation here. This is our Chai Curious brand that we put out after COVID-19 started. Oh man. I'd love a cup of tea. What's that? Chai Curious? I'm a little curious. Caramel Romance Black Tea Blend. Let's see what's inside. Oh no, it's loose leaf. Ugh, I can't drink this. What's this? A coffee maker? I could use this to make tea? Just like coffee? I just put a little filter in? I put in a little tea? And that's it? Close it up and go? Oh, forgot the water. Be right back. Bold and tempting tea blends. Made in your home coffee maker. Chai Curious. Are you curious? So that is one of the ways uh, that we have been able to reach a wider audience. Um, you may recognize that voice at the end there. Uh, and you may also recognize the wall uh, in the background. One of the interesting things about this experience where my physical space has been closed and uh, it's a space that we always prided ourselves in and being colorful is we've been able to use it as a, basically a media studio um, for that and some other projects. Um, so that was one of the ways uh, that we've been able to stay afloat. Lesson number two um, was really trying to listen to where our customers were at through the different cycles uh, and periods of, of the quarantine and uh, of the different executive orders. Um, and at one point in particular, uh, where I feel like I learned a valuable lesson, we uh, were a bakery. We've always been a bakery at Teetotaler, and we make a lot of British and continental and French pastries, some of which are kind of unique to this area uh, in terms of where you can get them or elsewhere and one of them is french macadon which is like a small meringue cookie and people loved it they're colorful they're very sweet and so i had noticed multiple people on this is uh, on our instagram uh this actual photo uh multiple customers of ours tagging us saying they were just trying to make them themselves uh or did they have any tips uh or, or did, did we have any tips for them and at first, that kind of just started off with us interacting and, and staying in touch with them online and helping them bake. And after a couple people reached out for this very specific uh, uh, education, we realized that there may be an opportunity to connect uh, with our business or with our customers even more. Um, so we started a program called the Big Gay Baking Day where we actually give away the recipes essentially and we sell baking kits to our customers. So again, and this is particularly in April and early May when folks were literally in their homes 24 seven, uh, looking for ways to diversify their routine, uh, shake things up a little bit. And so we would literally sell them uh, and package these baking kits together. Oh, here, let me see if you can see those so these would be like our we'd have this is like coconut macaroons we'd have our scone mixes uh basically again giving the recipe away except they, all they have to do is purchase the ingredients from us uh we would either deliver them or ship them because we'd already figured out our shipping and logistic plan with chai curious um and then what we would do is we set a specific date 
and we would teach people to bake on Instagram Live. So it was an interactive multimedia experience where they have a physical product that they love from Teetotaler and we're helping and teaching them to bake it at home. But we're also then encouraging them to use that platform to post and share about you know, baking with their kids or you know, what different recipes they tried out so that other people would see and experience it. Um, and this was you know, wildly successful. We're planning to do uh, several more of them, um, although we got a lot of orders, so it, I'm gonna have to hire even more staff, I think. But it was one of the ways in which we recognized instead of waiting around, holding on to our recipes, holding on to our so-called intellectual property, we had an opportunity to keep our community connected with us because at the end of the day, although the financial situation had to be addressed in terms of paying our bills, paying our employees and so forth, I knew that the worst thing for teetotaler would be if we're not going to reopen till 2021 and that day comes and we're ready and no one remembers us, no one has touched base with us, no one's looked at our website, we're at the bottom of Google search rank. And so this particular, you know, big gay baking day, baking kit program was a really great, great way of interacting with our customers on a regular basis and keeping them in the loop with what we're up to and bringing that kind of creativity of our kitchen to them. And uh, the final kind of lesson we took uh, to transform our business um, really came in the form of a delivery service. And uh, back on, I think, March 17th, so just a couple days after we were closed, uh, one of the things that we had always sold in-house was bubble tea. Um, it is a classic Taiwanese beverage. It's very popular in a lot of big cities in the States. It's sort of like a milky sweet tea beverage with lots of different flavors. Uh, and then there's like gummy tapioca pearls as part of it. And it's always been something we sold. It's always kind of a unique, fun, trendy uh, experience. And we just so happened to be having a St. Patrick's Day shamrock minty green special. And St. Patrick's Day was after uh, the pandemic had started and the executive order came down to close. So we decided though that we still wanted to at least reach folks there. And we thought we could just do some delivery. And I put it up on our website um, just to reach out to people that I would come and deliver your shamrock bubble tea to your door within like a I think at first we started with a 15 mile radius and uh, the orders were so uh, enormous that uh, I think I spent probably 12 hours preparing for and delivering uh, with a family member. Um, all of those, it, it was just one drink, Shamrock Bubble Tea. It's this fluorescent green beverage. Um, and it occurred to me that so many people um, like really obviously loved some of these beverages and were, were willing to support us that way. And so since then, uh, you know, we've, we call it doorstep boba and we've started to offer this service twice a week. Um, and the, it's all a pre buy business model so that people order ahead of time. So it's, I don't have to be in the shop on demand. It's, we had one today or there's one this Sunday and then we deliver it to their door and we text them. So it's a completely contact free service. Um, which just allows us to sort of be safe and responsive to the times. And it has been so successful that we have actually been able to hire back all of our full-time staff. Um, so for a lot of folks, while we were wondering, you know, if we're not opening till 2021, what are we going to be able to do um, to support them? Um, we've actually brought the staff back. Uh, obviously it's part-time, we're only doing it two days a week, although we just started doing twice a month in Concord because uh, we have another cafe opening there. And um, the business model itself uh, would not have worked, I think in earlier times. Again, you know, we're delivering it to people's homes. It's contact free. You can't order it on demand. This is not Grubhub. Uh, you have to order at least a day ahead of time. And Back in February, people probably wouldn't have done that. Maybe they're not home that often, and they certainly would want something within, I don't know, 30 minutes. And yet we've been able to succeed in this program by responding to kind of the current situation and recognizing that we're working with what we brought into this pandemic. We are a very small restaurant. We did not have a lot of capital. We did not have a lot uh, to keep us afloat uh, in our bank account. 
what we did have was a very strong, resilient community that loved us and supported us. And so this doorstep boba delivery service was able to flourish because we had a community through Instagram and, and, and online and um, our, our email list and so forth. That was a way that we were able to launch this business model, um, not because we had a lot of money to, to invest into it, but really because we had a community that was willing to stick with us and continues. I mean, I'm surprised every time the orders come in um, that we're still doing well, we're paying our bills, we're paying our rent, we're paying our employees, and we're making sure that when Teetotaler is ready to reopen, we will be just as relevant and top of mind and we will be well capitalized um, to do everything we need to do to open successfully. Um, and as part of this, and thinking about all of the different grants and programs that have sort of come down, um, whether it's PPP or the Main Street Relief Grant or the EIDL, uh, having these new business models, whether it's Chai Curious, the Big Gay Baking Day or Doorstep Boba, has allowed us to use this stimulus money to invest in the future rather than being a holdover to get us back to February. Uh, and just like with the Chai Curious, um, one of the examples of that is we've been able to um, start developing and, and actually investing in commercials um, for it. And so I just wanted to show you our, this is hot off the press, no one has seen this before, um, but how we're hoping to expand our doorstep boba program into other communities in the state. What the ah! is doorstep boba? Doorstep boba is a delicious Taiwanese inspired tea based drink delivered fresh to your door. So, how does it work? It's easy. So easy, in fact, you could do it from anywhere. Just hop on your computer or whip out your phone and go to doorstepboba.com. Once there, check that you are in a delivery zone. We deliver to cities and towns surrounding our cafe in Summersworth, as well as our soon-to-be location in Concord. Live elsewhere? No worries. We'll also be popping up in locations throughout the state. So be sure to follow us on Instagram for updates and to tell us where to go next. You'll also need to pick a delivery date. To cover the most ground while ensuring peak freshness, we only deliver to each location a day or two a week. The last thing you'll need to do is choose your drink. It's important to know, you can't go wrong in choosing a tea and you can't order too many. Place your order and that's it. We'll take it from there. We'll prep your tea fresh on your preferred date and perform a contact-free delivery straight to your doorstep, sending you a text to let you know your order has arrived. Enjoy your tea and be sure to tag us in all Boba Tea related content. So that will hopefully, uh, you know, be showing up um, on the gram and Facebook soon. Um, but again, one of the things it just speaks to is how uh, we can really, as small business owners, use these resources um, to invest. I never, as a restaurant owner, would have been able to pay for the production value of that commercial. Um, it, and just, I probably would have never had the time. And so I've, you know, been trying to use the opportunity of the challenges that come with closing a restaurant and having some financial insecurity to invest in the future um, and, and continue to make each of these business models more resilient. And one of the things that that has taught me and one of the ways I've been connected with Stratford Regional Planning Commission is how can we do that for other businesses? And so I've been fortunate to be working with Rachel, who is your tech support, I believe on the Zoom call here, uh, and the folks at Stratford Regional Planning and many Chamber of Commerce directors to develop a platform to help small businesses reach customers new and old through their changes and have customers reach Main Street downtown businesses, uh, even if they're changing the way that they do business. Um, so this is MightySmall.io. It is now live as of 3 p.m. today. Um, it has sort of been the brainchild of many folks involved in the Seacoast economy. And really the goal of it is that anyone can log on and, and search for a business near them, their main street, downtown Summersworth, downtown Rochester, downtown Concord, and see all of the businesses that are open 
or open in new ways. So maybe their favorite business couldn't be visited on Main Street, but you can go and do an online class. Or maybe your favorite you know, barber or hairdresser has new COVID protocols, and you can use this site to find out what's gonna be required of you and what to expect when you go there. So it's really meant for small business owners to feature their ever-changing adaptation strategy because we know that this is just one phase of many uh, and helping these businesses stay close to their customers in a multitude of ways is what's gonna make our small downtown economies more resilient. Uh, so I encourage everyone to check out mightysmall.io and uh, if you certainly live in the Seacoast area, you can order a bubble tea. Um, but yeah, it's been a real joy working with this group. Uh, and I look forward to seeing what comes next. So we are now going to pass it over to Jen Marsh. So Jen, if you want to turn your video back on. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, to come in. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, thanks everybody for joining us today. It's been a, a kind of crazy time. And, and, you know, Emmett's got some fabulous stories of how to be innovative. You know, a lot of businesses, um, all businesses kind of woke up one morning and, and business wasn't the same. They had to change everything about it. Um, some were even closed. So it was a scary time for a lot of people. We received a lot of phone calls and worked with a lot of businesses. And um, I am absolutely amazed at, you know, people like Emmett and our local Rochester businesses um, who, who have come through and come through some even stronger. Um, it's been a battle for most, but it's, it's, a, it's, I won't say fun, but it's, I, I'm very proud of the Seacoast and number one, how, you know, all of this group worked together. Stratford, Stratford Regional Planning has been fantastic in, in getting the Seacoast group together twice a week when we needed it. And now it's a little bit less. Um, just to talk about ideas and to talk about the same issues that everybody's having, um, especially when the funding came out and nobody knew how to apply. If I applied, did I get it? When am I going to get it? So lots of unanswered questions, but um, I think everybody on this phone call should just be made aware that this Seacoast region has really worked well together and, um, and, and come out, I think, on top of things. Um, so great to see. I am going to share my screen and then start my presentation. Um, this is not the same as the other day when we did it. So give me just a moment. All right. So my presentation today is on Rochester, Rochester businesses, um, and a couple of things that Rochester did, and I think kind of, you know, stepped up and, and made sure that things were in place on time um, before the guidance said that we could open. Um, one of the things in my picture here um, is of our downtown dining. So I'm going to cover the, the dining that we have done for the outdoors um, both on public and private property in the city. So these pictures here are our downtown Main Street. Um, it was probably, oh, let's see. We have an emergency operations center for Rochester. Um, and so taking daily phone calls, answering questions to whether it's churches, um, you know, civilians or businesses every day. Um, and so they were following the guidance very close as well as our economic development team. Um, the health inspector came up to me probably a week before guidance allowed for outdoor dining to open and said, hey, we need to come up with something and we need to come up with something quick because this is what is going to happen. Um, and, and it's exactly what happened. So we got a team together um, we have a team already in place for something like this for our outdoor dining. We call it our technical review group. So we kind of slimmed it down a little bit, uh, made it so that every participant in this group had the time and ability to go out and seriously, we spent a week on the ground, boots on the ground and meeting with restaurants and going over setups. Um, and you can see here, um, our outdoor dining, like I said, on Main Street. On the picture on the right is uh, Mitchell Hill Barbecue. And then on the left is right next door to them is our Fallen Leaf Bistro. And a little bit further down, um, he didn't have his umbrellas up yet, is the Rocks Lounge and Cigar Shop. So um, Mitchell Hill on the right decided, hey, you know what, I'm, we're gonna do this dining. Um, we got some local businesses to help us out um, deliver those barriers. Um, 
once those were in place, he went to town and built himself what we call the ark, um, but we love it. So it, it actually, you see how it, it abuts right up to the sidewalk. So when it comes to ADA compliance, uh, there was no issues there. Um, so that's a great picture of the, oh, I didn't even start my slideshow. So here we go. Um, no, it should be a full screen for you now. Um, so a couple of things with the, with the city property. Um, we had, and how we did it so quickly, is we had an outdoor dining policy in place. So what we did is we looked at that and decided, let's make it temporary. Number one, um, because restaurants are closed and it's such a difficult time for businesses, let's waive all fees. So there's no fees involved. Um, let's be innovative and, and find ways to expand. So like this picture here is Revolution Taproom and Grill. They have a lease with the city, so theirs is a little bit different. So they are already allowed an outdoor space um, that's in place, but they didn't have enough tables when you're looking at that distancing from six feet apart. So we said, hey, give us a plan. What can you do um, and where can you extend? Because we're allowing parking lots, we're allowing parking spaces. Um, so they came up with a plan that was something similar to this. Um, when staff met, we actually said, no, you know what? She didn't have enough tables with the way that we wanted to work it. So staff looked and said, okay, let's instead um, expand it. So we expanded. Um, she had wanted a little bit of this parking lot here, but we said, no, expand it back and, and take more tables. We'll give you all the space you need. Um, so we also worked with another company. This was SUR who donated those concrete barriers and these barriers here for our businesses um, to be able to do that without those extra costs that are involved. Um, so once we established that team and staff, um, we utilized the outdoor dining ordinance that we already had. I went through and I changed some things and made it a temporary ordinance. Um, for this city property, a little, little more difficult because you need to work with Primax, who is the city's insurance, and we had to come up with our insurance and indemnification qualifications um, and come up with that paperwork for the businesses to sign. But again, we had something in place, so we changed it a little bit. Um, got created with the spaces. So as of right now, our letter of approval that we sent out to all businesses, whether it's on private or public property, gave them um, the ability to dine outside until June 30th. At the beginning, back in March, um, when we were working on this, we didn't know how long this would last. So what we did is we met um, probably two, three weeks ago with the city manager. He has agreed to allow our outdoor dining um, to extend throughout our season, which our regular ordinance is for October 31st. Um, right now we're working with the state. We've got a call hopefully on Monday and we want to discuss with the Liquor Commission because that's something we needed to think about. Um, in the 2.0 version of the, the stay at home guidance, uh, there was uh, the temporary liquor license. It was just a quick email back. So the state has been fabulous about getting this outdoor dining open as well. And we just wanna make sure that extends. So if that does not extend, um, then we need to rethink and get some approvals from the Liquor Commissioner and the businesses would have to go that way about it. Um, otherwise, moving forward, now that we've established this, um, it was quite amazing on how much feedback we got and positive feedback. You know, usually in social media, you see people grumping and moaning about certain things, but the feedback that we received was all like positive. Um, people loved it. They want to see it happen. Uh, they're seeing more downtown foot traffic in the downtown. So currently, while you know, everything's in place and it's fresh on everybody's mind and we have a visual of what these restaurants are gonna do. So, you know, just looking at this picture here and then the last one of all the um, flowers and the, you know, the, the Mitchell Hill and their arc, as we call it, um, that was built and they're putting up fences and they're just beautifying and it looks fabulous. So while it's fresh on everybody's mind, um, staff is actually going to be working on changing our ordinance for the outdoor dining for next year. There was just a few things that we looked at and said, hey, you know what, this is a little bit too restrictive. We wanna open it up, give them more ability to make decisions on whether they have outdoor um, entertainment, um, whether they wanna stay open later, you know, depending on you know, how late it is. Uh, right now it's 11 o'clock, uh, but people wanna push possibly till one o'clock and, and follow the same liquor guideline rules. So we're gonna be looking at that and, and taking a step ahead before we get to next year and making sure it's all in place, um, looking for support of our city council to change this ordinance and 
keep moving forward because it's been such a such a great addition to our downtown. So that was all city property. So then when we talk about private property, a little bit different. Um, I've got a couple of pictures here. On my left is La Corona. Um, what they utilize, and again, that temporary application, they usually came up with a plan for us and then staff would go over. So he's got a driveway all around his building and he decided that he was gonna utilize and barrier off um, just kind of that outsourced outside area there. So here you can see people getting together. Um, you know, there are some umbrellas and tents up because it is hot out in the sun this time of year. Um, but adding the lights and the ambiance and, and making it look really neat, it's, it's fun to see. And then Lilac City Grill on the right hand side. Um, this is actually a driveway that they worked with their neighbor to say, hey, can we close this off for now? We'd like to use it for our outdoor dining. Uh, they put up that fence in the back to kind of shut off the area where some cars are parking and where it's not as attractive. Um, and so they were able to utilize, you know, a, a driveway. So downtown, a little bit different because we're looking at shutting off streets and parking. Um, but then the businesses that have the ability, we we were very, like I said, very innovative on on some ideas and and how to get these businesses open and get them open quickly. Um, staff, if anybody's on the call or from the city of Rochester, our staff was fantastic. We were out during the weekends um, and basically what we did was just say, hey, you're approved, um, but let's show the six feet apart and make sure you're following the guidelines. Um, and then went after and made sure that they were following the guidelines. And I think everybody, we, we really had no complaints um, on, on this dining process. So a lot of staff, a lot of overtime, but in the end, um, you know, it definitely helped our businesses go from their, their takeout, which could have been 20 to 30% of their sales, um, back up to kind of their 60, 65% range of the numbers that they were looking at. And then opening the indoor dining, we have also allowed to, you know, keep this outdoor dining. Um, if we open up 100% in Stratford County, that may change some things because you do need to take a look at um, seating capacity, your liquor license on how many you can have, um, how big your kitchen is and your food storage on how many seats you can actually have on location. Uh, so we'll be willing to work once 100% opens up, willing to work with those businesses to try to stretch that a little bit if we can or come up with a way to make it work for everybody. And uh, so that is our outdoor dining. Um, and again, at the end, you can ask me any questions you have. I think I covered everything on that. Um, so let's move on to our micro loan program. So this is another program that Rochester came out of the gates. Um, we, we base this on a program that we currently have in place from our uh, community development block grant, which we have an existing job loan program. Uh, those are federal funds. Um, one thing, one of the first steps before even the microloan program, as we were discussing it, we looked at our current job loan applicants uh, that have loans with the city, and we reached out to each and every one and said, "Hey, times are tough. You know, some things are closing down. Um, we don't know if you know um, production is happening as fast." So we let each one know that, "Hey, we're willing to do a forbearance on those loans." Um, the forbearance was for three to four months. I can't remember exactly what it was. So we have um, four out of our nine job loan applicants who did take advantage of that. So that was another way that we were able to just reach out and, and help our local businesses, um, which is the same program, like I said, that our microloan program came out of. So my boss, Michael Scala, um, had an idea that we've got, um, we got to help these businesses. What can we do? So he was thinking of a small microloan program, um, able to reach out and and do whatever we can for some of these for some of these shops. Um, Rochester is unique in the way that we have waste management fees. Um, so when we went to city council, we proposed that that money come out of our economic development fund, which the economic development department is funded a specific amount from waste management fees every year and put into a, an account. So those are non-taxpayer funds. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier for us to be able to loan this and to um, qualify that to, you know, to the citizens who live here and are paying taxes. So in the end, um, 
Mike went through when we got all the documents together. Uh, we did this reasonably quick. We got approvals from city council. Uh, the first amount was approved for 50,000. So we launched um, within five days of city council approval. We launched a program, put it out there on social media. Uh, we did have some fosters articles and, and you know, got it out as many ways as we can through the chamber and on Rochester Main Street. And the first time uh, for the 50,000, we had 13 applicants apply. Uh, we were able to fund all 13 of those loans. It did end up being more than the 50,000, but we did find an additional 9,500 for those funds. Um, and within two weeks, we closed them, uh, worked with the city attorney to make sure all the documents were correct. We actually did in-person closings, which I think um, definitely helped. Uh, that was at the beginning when, you know, city halls were closed. Um, we figured out from our um, emergency operations center on, on how to how to proceed with having in-person. Uh, so, you know, we cleaned in between each one, we left a little extra time, but getting to sit down and talk to these businesses about each and every one of their struggles. Uh, the struggles of, you know, hey, I'm working, but my wife's not, because now she has to homeschool and now we have this business. So, you know, like I said at the beginning, everybody had a struggle, each was different. Um, but being able to help these businesses and when we talked to them how much it absolutely helped them um, it was incredible so it was a great feeling to be a part of something like that for sure um, this one went off so well um, that we decided to do a second round so we went back to city council uh, we did receive another fifty thousand dollars approved from city council in order to do round two um, I'll just say at first, round one was done before your idols, uh, your PPP, and definitely way before the Main Street Relief Fund. So a lot of these businesses didn't know if they were getting any other funding yet. Um, some had received some, some were still waiting. Um, so that, that first, um, that first 50,000 was really critical to some of these businesses. So when we put out the next 50,000, um, we received three applicants. Um, we ended up approving uh, two of those applicants. The third, unfortunately, didn't meet the eligibility because they were not an established business before, I think we did February 15th for a date. Um, so we kind of followed all those dates with the SBA, the same with the SBA loans and guidelines that they were using. Um, so in total, we did 13 loans for 69,500. Um, those are deferred for 120 days from whenever we close. So those payments will start either September or October. Um, they are 24 months. So we get two years and the percentage rate is zero. Um, so just as easy as we could make it for some of these businesses. Um, I have this picture here of our downtown um, candy shop, Sweet Peaches. So she came in at round two, uh, thinking that they may get more of the um, paycheck uh, paycheck protection or the idle funds in which they didn't so they reached out and they said hey you know we we want to restock our shelves um, and so within two weeks of receiving her funds for the microloan uh, they are back in business um, they are open not as many days a week right now as they kind of figure things out but it's nice to be able to know that you know a loan could make sure and guarantee that they reopen their doors and we're ready to go um, for that particular loan, we did establish a loan committee as well. So we had three staff members and two outside um, representatives from our business community to be able to just make sure that, you know, we were looking at each and every one um, and making sure that, you know, we were doing it right. We didn't want to loan money to somebody who was guaranteed to fail. But at the same time, we weren't being that strict that we were going to say no because times are tough. Um, so I think I think we've, we've really done a great job with that. Um, the other topic that I'm going to discuss real fast and then I will be done. Um, I was asked to talk about food trucks and what Rochester did for food trucks. So at the beginning, and uh, our department really did not have anything to do with the food trucks, but I worked with the health inspector and um, he kind of told me what his plan was and, and how they allowed for um, food trucks to be placed in locations that weren't permitted by our zoning. So this again is a very temporary um, yes, you can go out and you can be on city property and you can place your trucks. Because right now we don't have any spaces for food trucks on city property besides a um, one location, which is at the commons. And then that's done through a different department. So coming out of this, we're looking at this and saying, hey, you know what, this worked. So what, how we allowed the food trucks, we didn't allow just anybody to come in. If you were already permitted in Rochester and had a Rochester food truck, um, 
then you were allowed to set up in one of three locations. Uh, those three locations were determined by the health inspector and uh, some other folks on his team for that. Um, they were to work on their own schedules on who was going to be where when and the city had nothing to do with that so we didn't have to spend that extra time. That was all up to them. They needed to follow all guidelines, um, you know, again with just a quick inspection once in a while and a check in from the health inspector or fire department to make sure everything was running smoothly but um, they've done a great job. Uh, this is a picture of the Sausage Express at our community center. He is still set up there most days of the week selling breakfast and lunch. Um, so. I think that's worked out very well. Um, it's also, you know, all of these, all of these programs with the outdoor dining and with the microloan and with the food trucks, I think have opened up staff's eyes. We've always had kind of these ordinances, but now we're saying, hey, you know what, we can make this even easier. We don't need to be so strict and and have all these rules and regulations to say this needs to happen when where what um it's been nice to allow our restaurants and our businesses and everybody to just kind of go out get a feel for it decorate um you know come up with some locations and kind of and take things on their own um so i will say and i i got this from uh, kind of this quote or uh, you know this saying yesterday from one of our city councilors and he mentioned to me how proud he was on not just you know our staff but our city council and how supportive they've been the staff on how they worked overtime and gone out of their way to to really help these businesses and then our citizens and other businesses in town that have gone out of their way so we had one business owner who drove downtown and said hey you just took nine parking spots downtown i can empty a lot up here tell people they can park all day every day in my lot um, we had two others that called within a week and said the same thing. Um, we've had, you know, businesses um, donate the, um, we've had two businesses, one I mentioned earlier, and then there's another one that uh, for the property, the restaurants on the private property, um, just donate barriers so that they can make it work. Um, so in our community, just going out and, and, visiting all the businesses, walking downtown. Um, so it, it's just, it's been a tough time, but at the same time, um, like he said, I am very proud to be from Rochester. I'm proud to be from uh, the Seacoast and, and having all of the Seacoast teams work together. So it's been tough, but at the same time, um, it's been great. So thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Awesome. That's some, uh, some great stuff from, from both Jen and Emmett. Um, Jen, it's really awesome to see you enabling local businesses to uh, be innovative and, and allow them to come up with their own creative solutions during this challenging time. And of course, Emmett, I mean, really impressive stuff that you guys are all doing there. So I'm just happy to be involved in uh, some of the really great ideas that are being presented today. And again, for those that we're not on the very beginning of the presentation when introductions took place. My name is Sean Menard. I'm the program director for Seacoast Eat Local. We are a, a nonprofit organization based out of uh, Dover, although we do service all of Stratford and Rockingham counties. And we also service um, parts of York County. Um, can you all see my blue screen there? Yes, we can. I'm sorry. I was Excellent. To... I just wanted to make sure. Um, and, and so Seacoast Eat Local's mission is to connect people to sources of locally grown food. We do that through a number of uh, programs, educational opportunities, and uh, some advocacy, depending on the time, time of year and also the, the current conditions of the world. Uh, a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk about our programs, what we do here at Seacoast Eat Local. I'm uh, going to talk about what we did to pivot during COVID-19 and also how we've changed our communications during this time. So for those that aren't familiar with Seacoast Eat Local, we have uh, four main programs. The first one would be the Seacoast Harvest Local Food Guide, which we've produced since 2007. That's an annual printed publication that um, gives consumers and people of the Seacoast region access to local farms in the area, as well as farmers markets, fisheries, and other related businesses. And since we uh, started doing this publication originally, 
Um, we have also created an online resource, seacoastharvest.org, which lists all of the same information plus more. It also has uh, an, an interactive map that shows you farms and farmers markets in the area, as well as um, fisheries and other information of that sort. Uh, we also, uh, for over 10 years, we've hosted um, one of the bigger winter farmers markets in the Seacoast region. We do that at Wentworth Greenhouses in Rollinsford, as well as Exeter High School. And that um, you can see over here, this is from this past season. Actually, I think this was the last market we had at Wentworth Greenhouses before we had to cancel the rest of the season. So this here would have been a uh, really beautiful day we had towards the end of February of this year. Seacoast Eat Local also um, administers a SNAP incentive program. For those not familiar with, with SNAP, that's um, what's formally is referred to as food stamps, electronic benefits for folks to receive, um, you know, on, on, on low income to reduce, to uh, receive food, the uh, resources. So we do that at area farmers markets and farm stands program we've done again for about 10 years or so, where we not only provide um, SNAP recipients to use their benefit at farmers markets, but we also provide matching incentives. So say a customer uh, has $50 in SNAP benefit per month to spend, our program at farmers markets enables them to double that essentially allowing them to spend $100 on local fresh foods. And then our newest program is the Seacoast Area Mobile Market, pictured over here, which I like to describe as equal parts food truck and farmer's market. So that's a, a custom vehicle that we had built in 2016. And what we do with that is uh, drive it around to different areas throughout the Seacoast region and provide uh, farmer's market experience for folks. We, uh, we target low income areas, senior housing, uh, areas where transportation is difficult or that, that might be a food desert, towns that don't have their own farmer's market. But we also do business and corporate events too. And this is, this is sort of what you're picturing over here in, in this image is um, we, we provide a benefit for employees of businesses where we, we pull up and uh, the company has paid us to come and provide fresh healthy food education and tasting experiences for their employees. That's also what we would be doing this time of year, which of course we're not. So that's a quick overview of what our programs are. And as, as I think Jen and Emmett both really did a good job of, of painting the picture, as of about March, March 13th or 14th, we really changed quickly what we did. Uh, our, our last winter markets of the season, we decided to cancel. We did have three left um, as of March 13th that we decided to cancel. Although it wasn't the decision of any of the venues in which we hold farmers, market, far, farmers markets, that was a de decision that we made so that we could give ample time to our vendors and our farmers to be able to find alternative outlets to sell their products. Because we, we essentially knew it was coming, you know, just like the other folks today said we you could sort of sense the urgency of the situation and you know as as emmett really did a great job you know describing his situation where they decided to close for all of 2021 or all of 2020 rather we felt similarly that we had to make a decision and start acting now so that we could be ahead of you know all of the other decisions that would have to be made down the road so we we decided to cancel the rest of our winter farmers market season and that meant that we had to work really hard with our vendors to enable them to sell the products that they had prepared to sell at our markets. You know, there's, there's not a whole lot you can do as a farmer when you've planted a spinach crop in your high tunnel, you know, and, and things are growing. And then all of a sudden the farmer's market lets you know that it's not happening anymore. So we, we worked really closely with lots of farmers to provide, um, you know, originally really small, pop-up farmers markets at their own location. So this was an effort to help disperse the crowds that are typically at our larger farmers markets, which if you haven't been to any one of them, we see anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 people within a span of four hours at our winter farmers markets. So we felt like 
the first step was to try and disperse those folks so that we didn't have so many people in one place. And then the next step was to start working with uh, local farmers to figure out if they didn't already have online sales platforms, how we could get them mobilized to sell products and possibly also deliver those products to the same consumers that, again, you know, it's, it's just as difficult for the vendors as it was the consumers, you know, the, the folks that come to our farmers markets were essentially just sort of cut off from their regular source of, um, of fresh food at that time. So we also started working temporarily with um, some area farm stands to temporarily accept SNAP as a payment method until the summer markets begin operating. So, you know, again, this is where the, the decision was really difficult because we knew it would be hard for a lot of the shoppers that do attend our uh, winter farmers markets that have SNAP as a payment method. We knew it would be hard for them because there aren't a heck of a lot of places around the Seacoast region that you can spend um, your SNAP benefit on fresh local food. So this was about uh, early April. We were able to start working with five um, farm stands in the area to start accepting SNAP as a payment method. It worked really well as a, pro as a pilot program to the point where uh, each one of those original farms that we started working with to accept SNAP is now working with the USDA to become permanently authorized to accept, accept SNAP as a payment method in addition to the nutrition incentives and the matching incentives I spoke about, um, each one of those farms is going to be able to do that long term going forward, which is fantastic from from uh, everyone's point of view, because there are so many folks compared to just three months ago that are now on SNAP and um, are using that for the first time. And folks that already had SNAP benefits have seen um, an increase in the benefit that they have to spend. So we just have been working really hard to make sure there are adequate SNAP outlets at local farms uh, to be able to provide all the folks that want and need to use those benefits on fresh foods. We wanna provide those opportunities for folks to do that. What we've also done, um, I spoke a little bit about our mobile market program where we would typically be driving that around and making stops to sell food. This season, we've totally shifted what we're doing to a food donation model so what we're doing is targeting areas that um, we felt like there was a strong need for, which have been primarily senior housing uh, areas and uh, food pantries, particularly small food pantries that operate on exclusively or mostly volunteers and have very limited hours and very limited facilities of their own to handle and store some of these fresh foods. Uh, we've been working with purchasing local food directly from the farmers. Oftentimes we're buying food from farmers that aren't as equipped to sell um, online or they don't have the vehicle infrastructure to do delivery routes and so forth. We're working with farms that um, otherwise may not have as many opportunities to sell their food. So we're buying fresh foods from farmers we're delivering that directly to senior housing sites and area food pantries who then, of course, disperse the food further to folks that typically visit the food pantry locations. And that's what you see over here. This was one of the senior housing communities that we delivered to early in April. Um, you know, even then, as far as local food goes, we were able to get um, some, some greens. I can't remember if it was spinach or lettuce. We also had eggs. We had some frozen meats. And we also had uh, mushrooms and dried beans all produced locally within the Seacoast region. And along with those items, we provided some recipe and cooking ideas for folks if they weren't as familiar with some of the foods that we've been bringing. So that's pretty much, um, you know, all of what we're doing with the mobile market now is we're just using the vehicle to make deliveries and, you know, when necessary, we can we can stop and sort of do a mobile drive through food pantry situation where we have some of these bags that we can just hand off to folks um, safely. That's what we've done with the mobile market. And then more recently, you know, from I'd say about the, the beginning or middle of May, we've been working with all the organizations that operate summer farmers markets to help them do that safely. Cause there's been, you know, just like Jen talked about with a lot of the downtown restaurants and businesses, there's been a lot of reconfiguring of space, and protocol 
So we've been helping summer farmers markets open for the season while also starting to think now about our next winter farmers market season uh, coming up this November is when our markets typically start. And just for reference, um, the way our, our planning goes is we pretty much have our winter farmers market dates locked in by May for the following season. So right now we don't have those dates locked in. We're having to look at alternate locations, um, possibly to, to spread out the vendors and spread out customers, have ample space available. Um, so we're working on that right now as well. And we're hoping to learn a lot from you know the next few weeks with summer markets operating in new and interesting ways. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we've changed our communications. So um, this is the Seacoast Harvest local food guide that I spoke about earlier that we've produced since 2007. Uh, this is about a 30 page printed guide that we distribute um, anywhere depending on the year from about 8,000 to 12,000 copies. We bring those to places like libraries, health centers, um, hospitals and other medical centers, as well as you know, gyms, and uh, in places like that. So we're typically, you know, the, the first few weeks of June, we're delivering boxes and boxes of this printed guide to all these locations. Well, this year we couldn't do that because we knew pretty much all the places that we would typically bring that guide as a resource. Um, those places weren't open to the public necessarily. So we, we shifted a lot of our budget to not print as many guides this year because we felt like we weren't gonna have as many opportunities to do that. And what we've done instead is over here on the right, this is a direct mailer that we're sending um, actually this week or next week. It's gonna be hitting mailboxes, possibly many of yours. Uh, this, is, this would be the front here where we've put um, a farmer's market schedule. This is another thing that we would have typically printed thousands of copies to deliver to area schools and fitness centers and places like that. So instead, we've, we've just put that right on this direct mailer to direct folks to local farmers markets and some of this text down here that you might not be able to see as clearly are some of those farm stands that I spoke about that are accepting SNAP as a payment method. Also on this direct mailer, we included the website for Seacoast Harvest. So rather than mailing a 30 page guide to roughly 30,000 homes in the Seacoast region, we just put a plug in for the online resource so that folks could go check out the interactive map. They could learn more about farms in their area um, and other farmers markets and stuff like that. We also put information that felt relevant to the times. Um, pandemic EBT, I haven't really talked anything about today, but that's basically what's happened with a lot of folks that didn't typically receive SNAP benefits that that are now able to access those benefits now. So we included a little bit of information for folks um, just to let them know, you know, here's basically what you have to do to be qualified and here's how to apply. And we, of course, included a little plug on this direct mailer about the, the SNAP match program, just in case folks were not already aware of that. And on the back, we decided to put this wonderful seasonal availability um, calendar that we actually have it's the last page typically of our, of our Seacoast Harvest Guide every year. We wanted to give people a reason to hang on to this. You know, instead of just getting it in the mail and tossing it in the recycling, uh, we wanted to put something that was useful and informative for more than just a week or two weeks. And, and you know, it sort of is presented like something that maybe you could put on your fridge or on your cork board at the office or somewhere else like that. So really what we've done here is we've consolidated all of the things we would be printing and posting and sending around this time of year into one item that we're just sending directly to people's mailboxes instead of you know, posting them at the library or delivering them to the hospital. We're trying to eliminate um, the barriers of getting our information to folks in, in we feel like a fairly creative way. Um, we've also created a number of images and infographics like this that we're sharing with several organizations. So this is just more specific information on the PEBT program. Uh, it, it really clearly states how you're qualified, how to apply. We've used this in several presentations and have, have uh, provided it to many um, service organizations just to help spread the word far and wide. We've also been really, really strategic on our social media posting because there is so much changing. 
especially with farmers markets and, you know, things like restaurants and cafes, like we've already talked about today, you know, from, from March 13th on, it feels like the information has changed, you know, if not daily, at least weekly. So we've been really strategic about anytime something new happens, we make a Facebook post about it. We include it in an email newsletter. We get it out to the public somehow electronically because it's been so hard with information changing so quickly that uh, we felt it way more necessary than, than we typically would to provide really frequent updates on all the changes on our social media pages. We've also used uh, Facebook and Instagram stories quite a bit more to help share specific posts from our, our farmers that are in our service area in restaurants and cafes and all the food producers that we can try and share um, their own stories and posts. We've been trying to do that and, and trying to make direct connections with consumers because, you know, the, the first few weeks and few months of this, everybody was at home. People had a lot of free time on their hands. They were scrolling through social media a lot. So we wanted to capture people's attention where they were, when they were. And so social, social media became something we really focused a lot on. And that's, that's the real core substance of what I have to share today. You know, I would encourage you all to continue staying safe and helping those in your family and your network purchase and acquire as much local food as safely as possible. You know, we, we all aren't as fortunate enough to be as tech savvy necessarily to order online or, or to do all the things we've talked about today. So when you're able to, help people in need that, that you know, you know, help a neighbor get some food from the farmer's market if you can. And always, you know, of course, follow your, your favorite farms and restaurants on social media because that really is the quickest way to get the new information that's coming out again every day, every week. Um, it's just, it, it happens so frequently that the information changes with, with hours or locations or offerings. So I encourage you all to, follow your favorite producers and restaurants on social media as much as possible. And if you have any questions uh, after today about anything I talked about, whether it's uh, farmer's markets in the area or the PEBT program, feel free to jot down my contact information here and uh, follow up with me um, after this presentation today if, if you don't have a chance to have your question directly answered. Awesome, thank you, Sean. Um, I'm going to kick off the Q&A. Um, we have, a, yeah, if the panelists want to turn back on their cameras, thank you. Um, we have a question first that was actually posed to everyone. So I think I'm going to start off with that. And then um, you guys can take turns um, answering that. And then we can get to some of the ones that went directly to the presenters. Um, so this is from one of our commissioners. She said, it feels like there are a lot of great steps to localize and downscale supply chains and reconnected residents with local food and other small businesses. It seems that this has great social, economic, and environmental benefits. How do you all think we might be able to maintain these positive changes moving forward? What is needed from consumers and what is needed from local and state decision makers? So we'll start off with Sean since he just finished his. Yeah, I would say from a consumer standpoint, just try and keep an open mind because there's, there's nothing really that's happening now that's going to feel like the way it's always felt. So that's something we've tried to do with consumers of our farmers markets and of the local farmer economy is just keep an open mind because it's not going to be the same experience, at least through 2020, possibly even longer. Um, you know, you're going to have to sort of be creative and go outside your comfort zone with ordering local food from a farmer online and having them deliver it to your home. And a lot of what we've seen is so much of what we've been talking about for the last couple of years, you know, with, with our local farmers is that a lot of them have really been wanting, you know, more interest from consumers to buy food online, to, to not just have farmers markets as the way to buy local food, but to have some sort of online platform and to have a delivery model to help keep up with, you know, the, all of the technologies and services that are being offered worldwide right now to get food delivered to your house. So I, I think this is going to be, you know, unfortunately through a challenging time, it's going to have um, hopefully some really positive outcomes for local producers is because it has pushed a lot of the commerce towards, you know, some really new and creative solutions. So I think, 
what we've seen and heard from producers that would typically be at the farmer's markets right now is that they're doing, you know, upwards of 200 or 300% of what they would typically do in this year because there are so many people interested in not going to the grocery store or they're at home so they have more time to cook using fresh ingredients. So, you know, it's been really a good opportunity for a lot of farmers, at least those that had an open mind to change the way they did things, or at least had some of the infrastructure set up so that they could sort of make a quick pivot and incorporate new tools on their website. Awesome. Thank you. Jen, we can go reverse order. Sure. Uh, and thanks, Sean, um, and especially for the plug for the Rochester Farmers Market, which we've uh, had for two weeks now, every Tuesday from three to six. Um, and your Dover and Portsmouth also have theirs as well, and they're all fabulous. Um, one of my favorite times of year is, is, is to get that fresh produce and meat. Um, I would say, Sean, can you tell us where you can pick up your, and maybe you mentioned it, where you can pick up your um, magazines, because that has so much good information, including all the local farms that are in the area, um, I know I've gone through it before and usually every year because, you know, what if I want to buy a half a pig or a half a cow and how can I do that and stock my freezer for the year? You know, there's definitely some, some ways to do that, but I think, you know, Sean is definitely a great resource. And if you ever want to do a winter farmer's market, if you're looking for locations, we might be able to help you here in Rochester. So I'd love to team up. That sounds great. Yeah. And, and we um, will probably be hitting, hitting the pavement with our delivery of Seacoast Harvest possibly as early as next week. A little bit later than we wanted to because we did have to change a lot of the content within the guide as farmers market locations were changing we, we had to go back and do a lot of edits but we're going to make a really big push this year to make the pdf version of our seacoast harvest guide available online so that folks that want to at least thumb through it you know can find it now and um, that will be available at all farmers markets in the seacoast region as well as um, you know if, if you're a customer of uh, something like the Three River Farmers Alliance that are making deliveries of fresh local food to your door. Um, we're going to work with folks like that to get Seacoast Harvest out to folks. And if, if there are any business owners or organizations um, as, as guests on this call today, feel free to follow up with me if you'd like to possibly get um, a box of Seacoast Harvest for your own location. I'd be happy to, happy to get one to you so you can give it out to your, your constituents or, or folks that you deal with every day. Awesome. Do you want to pass off to Emmett? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I certainly, from like my own business model perspective, am thinking about the things that I have learned that I hope never to revert back to just in terms of like the level of burnout and the type of business model that especially a lot of restaurant owners create for themselves that just kind of overcomplicate it. But I think one thing, and I'm glad you mentioned, the, the question mentioned sort of state and local politics. One of the things I'm really hopeful for in this experience uh, with other business owners and other restaurant owners and economic development professionals is there's kind of a new uh, political voice. I think that small business owners and restaurant owners in particular have like no political voice. We are overworked, we're tired. Uh, certainly we're the highest taxed in New Hampshire than we are anywhere else in the world or anywhere else in the country. And it just has never really lent itself for us to fight for changes. And to give you an example, like I think even if I were to imagine reopening this year as an in dine in establishment, if in September or October I were to get sick or a dishwasher were to get sick, we would have to entirely close and we would, I face the economic ramifications of that. Uh, there probably wouldn't be as much of a safety net at that point. And the truth of it is, if I got sick in February or January of this last year, um, I would keep working probably. My dishwasher would probably still come into work. And not only would that be acceptable and has been acceptable in this industry, but it's required for a lot of people just to pay their bills. And so I can't even... I struggle with imagining reopening as obviously we're committed to it and we're going to, but I really struggle with the idea that we're going to reopen and paid sick leave doesn't exist for my industry. Um, because I know that that could really kill my business uh, when there isn't a support. And so I'm really hopeful that a lot of small business owners and restaurant owners or folks that are waiting six or seven weeks for their unemployment check 
to recognize that we need to fix some things that we were kind of just ignoring for a long time. And so I hope more people run for office. I hope it activates people to recognize um, what they can do. I mean, certainly I love hearing the way that cities like Rochester quickly changed statutes to say this doesn't work now, let's fix it. I think our state needs to move so much faster. Um, and so, yeah, I hope farmers, I hope restaurant owners uh, kind of pick up that mantle and find their political voice because we cannot go back to February or else we're just competing with each other in a way that is not productive and it's not healthy. Thank you, Emmett. Um, well, while we have you, well, with your unmute on, um, we have some questions that came up during your presentation. Um, someone asked, one of our commissioners asked, are you considering adding live music? Oh, sorry, wrong section. <laughs> um, do you think you will continue to provide the door-to-door -door delivery and all other innovative virtual services after the restaurant reopens? Yes, we're gonna bring live music to people's doorsteps next. Um, no, yeah, I, I think we totally are. I mean, one of the th incredible things about this experience is I would never have thought while I'm making lattes behind the counter and hosting teen drag shows in the space to fill my van with bubble teas and drive around the seacoast. And, and here we are, and the thing I've learned is we are making almost as much money in a week which means we were making two times as much, uh, you know, daily revenue than we used to make. And, you know, I didn't set out to start a delivery service. You know, the goal of Teetotaler has its mission. It's ha it has its goals for summer's worth and for bringing a community together in Southern New Hampshire. But now, you know, so much of the limitations previously for Teetotaler was always financial. It, would, it was always hard to grow. It was hard to expand. It was hard to do more because at the end of the day, I had to make sure I was, you know, hitting my numbers and paying my, my team and so forth. And so if I can transform a business model in a post quarantine, uh, small business economy, uh, and that can bring in, it may not be the same it's bringing in today, but it can, it can sort of add to our, our revenue, then that's just gonna make me more resilient. It's gonna allow me to grow and expand more and bring that mission more. Uh, like I said, you know, we're opening a cafe in Concord. It's been under construction. The construction crew's on furlough right now, um, but we're delivering bubble tea to the Capitol twice a month. So I'm meeting and selling to customers months before they'll be able to walk into our shop on Warren Street. And so, yeah, I'm, I've learned so many lessons I could not I, it's crazy that I never did any of these, these things before and I will never go back. Um, we have along those lines, um, and this is from one of my coworkers and some people might know who this question is from. Um, all the Star Wars nerds out there want to know if you'll do a doorstep boba fat marketing campaign next year on May 4th. Oh, down. I'm, I'm, I'm plugging it in right now. You've got me committed. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we have a couple questions for Jen, so if we want to switch over. Um, this is the one I mistakenly started reading to Emmett. Uh, is Rochester planning to continue some of these practices after the current COVID-based restrictions are lifted, such as the food trucks and outdoor seating flexibility, including possibly outdoor music, uh, using areas such as parking spaces once all the restrictions are lifted? Oh, great questions. Um, <laughs> I'll start with outdoor entertainment. So as I said, um, one of our restrictions in our, in our outdoor dining ordinance now is that there is no outdoor entertainment allowed on the property. It couldn't even be somebody inside, um, you know, projecting their voice to the seats on the outside. So that's something that we're actually going to try to um, get in front of the city council in the next couple of meetings. So hopefully that will change. And we want to, that's part of something we want to get changed right away. And then as we continue to revise our outdoor dining ordinance, we want to keep that, um, we, want, we want to change that so that there is outdoor dining allowed. Um, on the, the um, food trucks, or let's stay with the outdoor dining because I didn't answer that 100%. Um, yes, we do want this to stay. So we would love to um, do the same thing. Um, however, next year, depending on you know, where we're at and whatnot, uh, there would be a fee like our regular outdoor dining ordinance, um, but yes. And so this was kind of a test run for us because nobody's really done the parking spaces. So next year, uh, three of the restaurants that are in the parking spaces on North Main Street have all said, yep, I'm interested in again next year. So we do plan to do it. Uh, we're looking for some funds to potentially purchase those 
barriers that are out there. And um, we've had some innovative ideas brought to us like, hey, let's have the high school paint them. Um, you know, let's make it festive. Let's, you know, let's do some things a little bit different. So absolutely, um, we want that outdoor kind of atmosphere. Um, and we'll see how far we take it. You know, there's been conversations of let's shut, shut it down to a one-way street, uh, not one way, but like a one lane street or let's shut the whole North Main Street down. So we really, need, you know, kind of need to take it step by step, but yes, um, I think it was a great way. The best thing that came out of COVID was our downtown dining, um, for sure. Um, the food trucks, we are discussing that probably after this season. Um, we have talked about that in the past, but I think now that we've actually seen that it works and it works well, um, we need to change our zoning and, and allow for food trucks, but we need to figure out where first. So that's going to take a committee. That's in my, my file that says after COVID, um, you know, when we're back and everything else that we're really working on to get pushed to make sure it happens for now, um, that is that is on our on our uh, schedule to get done. So absolutely, we, we did have some great things happen and some great ideas that we will want to move forward and keep. Awesome. Um, one other question, what elements of the Rochester economy have been the most resilient during the COVID climate so far? Particular. Oh, I, I, that's different. So each, each business is a little bit different. Um, you know, I'd, I'd say restaurants, once they got the outdoor dining and they, they learned to do it, um, and now that they've got the indoor, I won't say they're resilient at the beginning, but um, they've persevered. Um, there's been, let's say, some of our shops are unique shops. Rochester has a lot of unique shops downtown um, where they sell, you know, all of those May 4th and Star Wars and all that kind of stuff. Um, Collectiques, we've got um, uh, the, the Jetbacks comics, we've got the um, Skeleton Records. So I would say those with their ability to turn on their online, little social media, sell it online. So um, a lot of those did well. And um, I would also say the most resilient and then probably did the best is kind of your food, fast food kind of to-go joints. Um, so anything with pizza, subs, um, delivery service, those you'd, you'd call and it would be about an hour wait. Um, but every other industry has been hit in different ways. So even our largest manufacturers, some of them have had to do layoffs um, up to 40%. Um, some of them have found that they can manufacture and, and help in the production of some of these, um, you know, the, the protective um, equipment that people are wearing. So it's, it's either or. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Sean, we have a couple questions for you. Um, you actually addressed some of the stuff in a couple of the questions, but um, does Seacoast Eat Local have a program in place to help people grow their own food? Uh, that's a really good question. So we don't right now. Um, I've seen a lot of really nice um, online virtual courses coming from the UNH Cooperative Extension uh, for the last few months. And I, I would only expect them to continue with some really nice gardening classes. I think they've had a really nice variety of, of um, gardening classes that they've put together. So we would like to work maybe a little bit closer with organizations like that to continue offering those programs and maybe have you know some some farmers as guest presenters on things like that. It's not something we've talked a whole heck of a lot about right now, uh, but you know to be quite honest, I think it's going to be a really big part of what Seacoast Eat Local tries to do going forward is not only trying to educate consumers on how to grow their own food, but what to do with that food after it's grown or what to do with food once they buy it from the farmer's market. So we would really like to get more involved in you know, nutrition education classes and workshops and cooking classes and workshops uh, with you know, not, not just UNH Extension, but also several other fantastic programs that UNH operates. And you know, we're, I think what we're gonna do for, for at least the summer is just kinda see how the season goes and then start thinking more specifically this fall about what sorts of programs we can offer to get people ready to grow their own food possibly for next season. Because of course, we're, what are we, July or June 25th today. So it's a little bit hard to start planting your garden on a whim at this point, but um, I think that is something we, we would really like to get more involved with going forward. Because you know, the, the great thing about this is it's, it's really gotten a lot of people interested in gardening that maybe just didn't have the time to think about it or time to learn about it. Um, it's got a, a lot of people really interested to start their own small gardens this year. 
So we're hoping those people stay interested for the future so that they can become uh, possibly small homesteaders of their own to, to produce quite the yield in their own home gardens. Thanks, and it seems like UNH has some, some great resources to leverage too, so that's good. Yeah, absolutely. And similar to what I asked Emma and Jen, um, do you have plans to continue some of these partnerships and initiatives that have come out of COVID, like having the individual farms have SNAP benefits, that kind of thing? Absolutely, yeah. So we, we received a small grant from the Nutrition Incentive Hub to continue working with farms and farmers markets that don't already accept SNAP. So we're trying to get um, another eight to 10 locations on board with SNAP by the end of this season. So that's something, you know, we've, it's, has always sort of been on our radar is how to grow the amount of SNAP retail outlets at local farms. And this is really helping us accelerate that. So we're gonna continue doing that for the foreseeable future. And I would also say the same of the mobile market, although I, I don't expect it to stay a strictly food donation model going forward. I think that is something we would like to incorporate more into what we do with the mobile market. You know, if anything, all of this is helping us see that there's a little bit more of a variety of things that we can do with that vehicle because it is such a unique asset to what we do. And we've, you know, just started um, hopefully going to be working with Gather Food Pantry out of Portsmouth to help them reach some of the smaller food pantries they're not able to service. So I think this is something that we can also do to, to extend our season because typically with our mobile market, it's really only active for the most part from June to about the end of September. And then from the, the rest of the year on, it's really hard for us to do anything with the vehicle, just the way the program has been set up. So hopefully this will give us more opportunities to have really nice activity and impact on our shoulder season where we typically would you know, just have the, the vehicle seasoned for the winter. Um, we might be able to do some more stuff throughout the year. Thank you. We have one more each for Emma and Jen, and then in interest of time, um, we'll finish up with those two. So I'll go, just because order on my screen, I'll go to Jen. Um, if outdoor dining is to continue beyond COVID, how do you see restroom street travel and pedestrian travel to be affected? You know, those are questions that we all have to look at. So right now, um, we're utilizing the parking spaces so that we don't interfere with the pedestrian um, walkways and things like that. So that's something that we need to consider. Um, as of right now, all of our restaurants have enough bathroom capacity in order to um, work with what they have for seating. And that's currently, again, with the 50% indoor and then the outdoor dining seats that they're allowed. Um, if we get full 100% capacity, then, you know, we'll have to take a look at that, um, uh, you know, that, but who knows. Uh, there's also talk and, you know, kind of plans on the purchase of another building downtown, and I'm going to push for public bathrooms in, in that area. So, you know, there's a lot of different things going on and a lot of different projects that we're going to take it all in, in one big picture and say, hey, you know, if we add this, then, you know, maybe public bathrooms in our downtown would be a benefit. Um, and that type of thing. And did I get both or all, there was two or three topics on that question. Did I get them all, Shana? Um, sorry, there's stuff moving around. People, we're working off a joint document. Um, I believe you did. We're gonna say that you did. <laughs> okay, <laughs> perfect. Thank you. Uh, and then we'll shoot over to Emmett for the last question. Um, Someone was asking, will a mostly online and door-to-door -door delivery service be able to create the same level of community and um, kind of relating that to your community mission with Teetotaler? Uh, certainly not the same level or kind. I mean, we are always looking for ways to take the, you know, the canvas that is Summersworth or the greater Seacoast region uh, and liven it up and make it more vibrant. You know, as a small example, every year at our cafe, inside and outside, we would do a big uh, Kate Bush flash mob uh, where folks would come and join and uh, don red dresses and dance to, uh, you know, 70s British pop of Kate Bush. And now we're citing a location somewhere in a large field where we can still do that safely. It's not in any way tied to our business model. We don't make any money off of it. But again, to continue to sort of bring the, the programming and the fun but I think the reality is um, 
all of our customers or would be customers are all looking for ways to connect and all of the different avenues they have, whether it's uh, going to the children's museum or their public library or going out dancing, um, all of them are, are virtually closed down. And so what I really think of my role and teetotalers role is how can we make the most community out of the tools we have. So for example, this month it's, you know, it's pride month and usually there'd be big pride parades and everything. And so we basically with the doorstep delivery service ran what we called the pride challenge where folks would get different stickers from their deliveries and they could post on them on their Instagram story and tag us and we would share it and post it. And so you can see visibly online, lots of different people connecting with us and connecting with each other and engaging in a way that, you know, they might just not have, if they were just ordering takeout from one restaurant, um, it would be very sort of silent. And so we always think about ways that we can get our customers talking to each other. Uh, and right now that's just more of an online platform. We last month did a fundraiser for SOS Recovery uh, and everyone that got bubble tea was able to donate and their, their purchase, whether they donated or not, was a contribution to SOS. We're doing the same thing with Seacoast Outright this Sunday. And then all of those people that maybe just wanted a bubble tea have now learned about a community organization. So it's not a one-to-one. -one. We're very much looking forward to having our, our drag shows and our variety shows and our flash mobs. Uh, and some of that will come online. Um, but until then, we're going to use the tools we have to make sure people do feel connected to their local community. Well, thank you all so much um, for joining us today and for your presentations. Um, we really appreciate your time. And um, if you have any follow up questions that we didn't get to, feel free to email those to us and we can connect you with the presenters. I don't know, Jen, if you have anything. No, I would just, again, I would thank everyone for joining us in, in a webinar-based uh, format for our annual meeting. Um, I know it's unusual time since we're all adapting the best we can uh, to, to COVID-19 and, and trying to get innovative. So um, I thank all of our attendees for joining us here this afternoon. And again, I would thank all of our panelists for really fantastic and wonderful presentations today. Thank you all.